can no longer prevail against it. We thank you for that. I thank you for the lives of everyone here. And I thank you that we've gathered around your, your word, that we may grow in the accurate knowledge of it. Thank you for utterance. Thank you for insight. Thank you for understanding. And if there's anything that is not of God in our understanding that stands in the way, Father, it is rooted out to the praise of the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. What a lovely way to start a Monday teaching with hearing such good news that Sister Angela just brought. You see now, you see, you see what is going on, folks. Let's just stay, let's just stay faithful. I want to say a big thank you. I want to say a big shout out to my own brother in the faith. I know he's very busy, but he's here in the person of, you know, uh, Reverend Isaac Kwasante. I salute you, sir. And also, may I say a very lovely welcome to um, the GC Europe Director in the person of Reverend Adikulati. Also to the leaders, yeah, um, Sister Hetty, um, Sister uh, Angie, and Sister Nina, and also Sister Vivian, we give you praise. Whilst we wait for others to come, let us get into the subject of our study. The subject of our study is that, you know, we are talking about spiritual growth. And because we are in a fresh week, let me summarize it now. Spiritual growth. And we said that spiritual growth, what it is and what is not. So just to make it simple, spiritual growth is getting to grips and understanding clearly the epistles. That means the more of the epistles you read and understand how they explain the Old Testament and the Gospels, you are growing. The lesser of the epistles you read, you will not be able to see how it all comes together. We also say that spiritual good means that the more you read the epistles, the epistles in themselves is loaded with power, changing power. And the more you read it, the epistles themselves will generate in you a strong desire to be hungry for more. The more you read, the more your hunger. The more you read, the more you want to know. The more you read, the more you want to get into it more and more. And it never ends. When we say it never ends, it does not mean that you know, the Bible has got so many things we will never know. No, we know what the Bible is about. Salvation by faith in Christ Jesus. But now, the reason why we read it constantly is to know how it all fits together under just that one thing. So when I read Genesis, can I now know what is pointing to salvation to faith and what's not pointing to salvation to faith? When I read Exodus to Malachi, can I see what, what are the statements in there that point to salvation by faith and the ones that don't point to salvation by faith? When I come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, can I see the statements and the messages or the language that points to salvation by faith and the ones that point, point to salvation by faith? Then when I come into the epistles, can I see how the same theme of salvation by faith is used with different language styles by Paul, by Peter, by John, by James, and Paul's letters, to Timothy, Titus, Jude as well. Can I see that pattern? Once you begin to see that pattern, that is what we mean by spiritual growth. Therefore, we say spiritual growth is not how long a person has stayed in church because you can be in church for long and you will never know this pattern. Spiritual growth is not a position that you occupy. Like, you know, I was ordained as reverend minister because I'm ordained as reverend minister that means that automatically you know, I've grown spiritually. No, I can be a reverend minister, but I will not see that pattern. See that now. So we also say that spiritual growth also means that in seeing that pattern, then you are falling into what we call the Jesus style of Bible interpretation of the Old Testament as the blueprint and how he gave it to the apostles as what should be preached under the New Testament. That's what we said. Then we also came to certain things that now, in that regard, that means that there is a way to be able to use that knowledge of the epistles to deal with any subject under the word of God. Any, any subject or anything, you'll be able to know that. And we said, what is that? So for example, we came to this point of the area that whether it is the topic of water baptism, whether it's the topic of tithes that we're talking about, whether it's communion, whether it's feet washing, whether it's mantles, like I said, some people call it mantles, whatever it is. That Jesus style of explaining the Bible, which he gave after resurrection, beginning at the books of Moses, all the way through, right, to the end, concerning himself, right, 
So we said, for example, when a believer sees Bible passages, but they are not able to reconcile. When we say reconcile, I see it here like this. Ah, but I see another one to say it like this. For example, the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. So it says that God loved. But then when you come to first John, it says, love not the things of the world. You know, so then you say, but Jesus said he loves the world. But now he's telling me not to love the world. Is that a contradiction? So now when I am not able to know why he said he loves the world and why he's saying here, love not the world, that inability to know why he said love here and don't love here means that you have not been reading the epistle. So you can't see the style, why it should be explained that way. Why is it like this here? Why is it like that here? Once you begin to see those patterns of reconciliation, when I use the word reconciliation, how do you see that it is all the same thing it's talking about, but just that he used this word here to mean this and use this word here to mean that you are beginning to grow. So once a person says, but it is in the Bible, for example, communion, it is in the Bible, but are we to practice it? I saw it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, but is he saying we should practice it? I saw it in Matthew. Jesus said on the last day, then he took the cup and he took the bread, the bread, and then he took the cup and he broke, this is my body. This is the blood in my new covenant. Was he telling us to practice it? Why? It means that it is possible to read, but it is possible also to miss the fine details. So spiritual growth is the ability to give attention to details and attention to continuous reading. This is what I've noticed. When you don't read continuously, you will miss the details. So when you start reading, the spirit is beginning to show you the pattern of Jesus' style. When you stop, you were in the process of getting there, but you stop, you will miss it. You have to start all over again. So we said that, for example, a lot of believers are still immature in the area of understanding how to explain forgiveness of sins from the Old Testament to the New Testament as to whether sins are to be confessed or not. Then we said in the pattern of Jesus' style, how did Jesus do it? Beginning at Moses, the writings of Moses. What are the writings of Moses? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then he said the prophets, first Samuel to Malachi. He also talked about the Psalms. Then we also came to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So that means that in every subject of the Bible, you have to follow that order. Check up Genesis. Is it there? Genesis before the law. Check up Exodus chapter 12 to Malachi. Is it there? Check up the Gospels, which is still an extension of the law. Is it there? Check up in Acts. Is it there? Check up also in the epistles. Is it there? Then now you do what I call a mathematical ratio calculation. What you do is that, how many times did it appear in Genesis? Zero. How many times did it appear from Exodus to Malachi? It was there. How many times was did it appear in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? It was, then you know that that is still under the law. What about Acts? Nail. What about the epistles? Nail. So which is more, which is less? Genesis? Nail. Acts? Nail. Epistles? Nail. Verses? Exodus to Malachi. So the Genesis, Acts, and the Epistles are more than what we see in Exodus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Once that is established, then you know that it is not required. So that is the yardstick. Then you ask yourself, was it before the law? Yes or no. Was it under the law? Yes or no. Was it in Acts? Yes or no. Was it in the Epistles? Yes or no. If you use this barometer, you will not struggle in Bible study. Then you are growing. So with that at the back of our mind, let us now jump to something else which we dealt with before we uh, broke off for last week. And that concerns still the area of, you know, this area of whether confession of sins or not. Now, so we said that, therefore, part of spiritual growth is the ability to see, to make such accurate handle, handling of Bible explanations. And we're going to do, so today, 
I'm going to show you something, even though you've heard some of you know, but let us deal with the first John 1 9. Let us investigate this to get a better understanding. Let us have a look at the forgiveness of sins under the letters. We've done that under the epistle. We saw that it was, the, he said, this, the forgiveness is a gift. We never saw in any of the letters Paul writing to anyone and say that, let them confess their sins. So if you look at the whole scene before the law, Genesis, nobody confessed sins. Up to Exodus 12, all the way to Malachi, sins were confessed as under the law. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, still under the law, sins were confessed. Acts, they never asked anybody to confess their sins. Romans to Jude, nobody was supposed to confess their sins. So if you look at from Acts all the way to Romans to Jude, there was only one place. There was only one place that we saw the word confess. Confess. Now, when you see the word confess, there are two sides of it, and you must be diligent to know which one. There's the word confess, which means to admit. That's the negative side of confession. Then there's the positive side of confession, which comes from the Greek word homo logeo. Homo, that is to say the same things or to side with what has been said. It is sad that the church world focuses on the negative side of confession, which is to admit that you are wrong. Meanwhile, the apostles didn't emphasize on that. The apostles emphasized on the positive side to say the same things that the word has told you about concerning what Christ has done. Confession of confession or declaration. It is homology, and we shall come to that some more later. So with that at the back of our mind, let us look at the negative side of the word confession, which is to admit that you are wrong. Is the Bible telling us that anytime we sin, we must admit that we are wrong? And the only place in all the epistles is 1 John 1, 9. In the book of James, the only time he said you must confess sins, he said, he said, confess your faults one to another. He didn't say God. One, he said, admit your faults one to another. So now, let us go into this area of First John 1. But I'm coming to come from some angles. So follow me carefully, like I always say. Follow me very carefully on this. Follow me very carefully on this. All right. So let's take that First John 1, 9, which is um, the popular verse. Okay. So let's go to the 1, 9. I'll just read it, and then I'll pick it up. He said, if we freely admit, you see the word? So it's the negative side. I said that there are two signs, sides of the word confess. The negative side to admit, the positive side, which is what? To say the same things that the apostles have said about you in terms of what you have received in Christ as a lifestyle. Homo logeo, homo logo, homo one, logo word, right? Okay. He said, so this one is the negative one. This one is the negative one. If we freely admit, let me look at it in the Greek lexicon and see what that word is. If it's saying this, and let's go to First John 1 9. Let me just bring up my lexicon stuff here. You know, that's how you do Bible study. You know, you don't take the English word always so because the English language can always be misleading. So let's go into what the Greek said about that, the verse 9. Let's see what it is. Let me see what it said concerning that. Let's go back there. Let me just see one second. All right, so let's go there. Okay. Now, look at the, if you can see on your screen, I don't know if you can see on your screens. Now, he said, uh, I'm looking on this side. So this is the Greek lexicon of the New American Standard Version here. If we confess our sins. So the word confess here, please take, watch your screen. Watch your screen with me here. This is the Greek word here. Look at that. So you see that if I stayed, if I stayed with the same English word in the Amplified Translation, do you see what I'm going to get, get wrong? He used if I admit, I admit. But no, no, the word used was homologemen, which comes from the word homologos, to say the same thing. Ah, you are not seeing it. So that means even the first John 1, 9 is not talking about confessing or admitting that you are wrong. because homologen look at look at the look at look at the entry here, here is to speak the same to speak the same to agree from homologos of one mind see that now see that now so let's go into we'll get it will get better you get it clearer so 
the English made it admit, but the Greek is homologo, huh? homologo, to speak something positive. And later you see that, you will see what he's referring to when I get to, I don't want to jump ahead of myself. So this is the verse that everybody has been using to say that the believer, when anytime they sin, must confess their sins. Now, first of all, there's something wrong with that. Because if we say we should confess our sins, that means that you must confess every, every. And we sin in three ways, in thought, in words, in actions. So that will be a, that will be a Herculean task for me to remember all that I was thinking. That means I must probably have a notebook and jot down anytime a wrong thinking comes into my mind, write it down. Anytime I say something bad, write it down. Anytime I act bad, write it down. Then when I'm going to pray, I must enlist all of them. If you want to be sincere with that word, that is impossible. That is impossible. It's not going to be possible. Number two, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. He said two or three. Two or three. First John 1, 9, falls under two. It is the only verse in the entire writings from Acts to the book of here, Jude, and here, that says, if we confess one. So it falls below the minimum requirement for it to become a doctrine as a consistent practice. That is the second reason there. Now, the third one is I'm what I'm coming to show you. It would be wrong for me as a good Bible teacher to start teaching this from verse nine. That is not consistent with accurate Bible explanation. Do you read your own storybook from the middle? Do you watch a film from the middle? When we are having our bath, don't we start from top to bottom or we start from bottom to top? Do we start the year from where? Starting from where? July. Then, you know, even in normal life, we always go from the beginning and we go to the end. So which means that to, for anybody to start teaching forgiveness of sins or confession of sins right from the middle, is plain dishonest. You are being dishonest. You are not following the way Bible should be explained. So that means we need to go up. So let's go up. You have to do the verses before and the verses after. Now, I want you to notice something which I'm going to deal with before I come back to this. Watch. He started. We are writing. Who are the we? About the word of life in him who existed from the beginning whom we have heard, whom we have seen with our own eyes, whom we have gazed upon for ourselves and our touch with our own hands. Wait. The whole thing doesn't make sense straight away. So you need to find out who is the immediate audience and who is writing, John. Now, don't forget that the Bible is a continuum. John also wrote other books the gospel of John. This one, first John, then second John, and third John. Notice something in the scenario. So let me go to the book of John chapter one. Let me show you something there. Please, I want you to follow me because if to, I, I, I might not be able to come back to do this. Get this once and for all. Let's go to John chapter one. So this first John one, night debacle is buried once and for all. So John also wrote what? Another book called John, the gospel of John. This first John is the letter of John. This one is the gospel of John. Let us see how he started. Watch. In the beginning, before all the time, was the word Christ. And the word was with God. And the word was God himself. Flip back to first John. We are writing about the word of life in him who existed from the beginning. Did you notice the word beginning? Look at that. Huh? Beginning. Let's flip back again to John chapter 1. That's the word again. In the beginning, don't you see some similarity? Don't you see some similarity? Don't you see a similarity? Now, so the two are put side by side, right? In John, the gospel, who was his audience? Jews. 
Which kind of Jews? Born again or not born again? Nobody was born again at this time yet. That was his audience. Could that be because the book of John was written way after even some of the epistles do? Could it be that he was writing a sequel, a continuation to his audience again in 1 John? We are writing about the word of life in him who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard, whom we have seen. Wait, it looks like he's still referring to Jesus in the flesh. He's talking about the three and a half years of Jesus when he walked in the face of death. So that means his introductory verse is the incarnation of Jesus. He's not talking about post-resurrection Jesus. He's talking about pre-resurrection Jesus. Now that changes everything. So before I go further in that and come back to it, watch this then. Now, that is an oddity. Because if you look at the beginning, his style of writing here and in John are similar. He seems to be introducing Jesus to some people who don't know him. All right, if you doubt that, let us now go back into all, some of the episodes and see how the apostles always wrote their letters when they were talking to believers. Okay, so watch. Let's go from the beginning. Let's go to the first, let's go to Romans. Look at Romans chapter one. Observe, observe, observe. Romans one from Paul. Did you see that now? First, he introduces himself, a born servant of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, called to be an apostle, a special messenger, set apart to preach the gospel, the good news of and from God, which he promised in advance long ago through the prophets in sacred scriptures. The gospel regarding the son was as to the flesh, his human nature was descended from David. As to his divine nature, according to the spirit of holiness, was openly designated the son of God in power, in a striking, triumphant, and miraculous manner by his resurrection from the dead, even Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Messiah, the anointed one. It appears Paul, his audience, is being pointed to after resurrection as a fulfillment, whereby in 1 John, there was no such introduction there. It looks like John's audience is different from Paul's audience. John's audience don't seem to know about Christ at all. Because if they knew, he would, have, he would have alluded to the resurrection. The resurrection is written to men who are, who, are, who are born again, who are aware of that. But it appears that in the case of 1 John, nothing like that was mentioned. See that now? Let's look at another, another introduction of Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul someone by the will and purpose of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother sustain us. Look at that. Look at, look at, look at this audience to the church, assembly of God, which is in Corinth, to those consecrated, they are, and purified, they are, past tense, and made holy, not going to be made holy, in Christ Jesus, who are selected already and called to be saints already together with all those who in any place call upon and give honor to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Did you see that now? So definitely, this is post-resurrection. After resurrection, people who have received Christ, clear. See that now? Let's take another one of Paul. We're going to sweep across. You see, this is part of spiritual good. How did I know this? Because I read it so many times. I came to see the Jesus style pattern. That is how it's done. If you read it so many times, you can come to the same arrival point. It's not different. Knowing that it's spiritual good, you have grown in the understanding of how the message is being explained. It didn't come overnight. See that now? Now imagine if I never did consistent with that. I will not see this, though it is there. Look at Galatians chapter one. Paul, same, same style an apostle, special messenger, appointed and commissioned and sent out, not from anybody of men, nor by through any man, but by, through Jesus Christ and God the Father, 
who is raised from the dead. Did you see that resurrection is included? Did you see that? Now look at this verse too. Once he mentions a post-resurrection fact, he tells us his audience, and always you will not you will find out that once resurrection is mentioned, the audience are born again people and all their brethren. What is the word brethren? The word brethren is the Greek word adelphos, people that come from the same stock, the same womb. Who are with me to the churches of Galatia? The churches are not building people that have the same experience in Christ of the resurrection. Now let's move away from Paul. Let's come to Peter. First Peter. Also same style. He introduces himself. Peter, an apostle, a special messenger of Jesus Christ. Now look at this. Look at this. Look at these people he's writing to. Writing to the elect. The word elect is electors. It's the same word that is translated as church. Those who have been elected in Christ. Not like the, some special people, no. The elected exiles of the dispersion. That means this gives us a clue. That means these guys were, he's talking to guys who there was a persecution and they ran away, they scattered. But as they ran away, they still continue to preach the gospel. So these are also born again to the elect exiles of the dispersion. Where are they scattered? Where? In Pontus. That's a region in Galatia. Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Bithynia is not Africa. Okay, he has not finished. Same language like Paul, past tense, who were chosen already and foreknown by God already, by the Father, and consecrated already, sanctified already, made holy already by the Holy Spirit, to be obedient. The word obedient means to believe to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled already. See that now? See that now? May, now the word may is not in the original. It's not a prayer. He's informing them. Grace, because once you bring may, you are forced to bring B E B. So it looks like now you know. So the may and the B cancel each other out. Grace and peace is given, not be given. Because he has already said you are sanctified. How is it not going to be given? In increasing abundance, that spiritual peace, which is, is not to be, which is realized in and through Christ from fears, agitating passions, and moral conflicts. Did you see that again? Once again, audience, believers. How do you know it's believers? The style and patterns. Let's look at Paul's letter to Timothy. He introduced himself. Paul, an apostle, special messenger of Christ Jesus, by appointment and command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, spiritual blessing and favor, mercy and heart peace be yours from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Then he goes on. And as I urge you, when I was on my way to Macedonia, stay on there. Stay on where you are at Ephesus. So Timothy became the pastor of the church of Ephesus, where Paul said, I pray for this church that the eyes of their understanding will be enlightened. He said, stay there. In order that, watch, watch, that you may warn one, admonish and charge certain individuals not to teach any different doctrine. So people are saying that we should not be saying that, you know, people should not be, you know, do feet washing. Look at Paul's stand advice. Make sure, Timothy, no individual will start to teach outside the style, the syllabus of the Jesus style of Bible interpretation. And when you correct, say that you are being too forward. But that is a core value in ministry. When you say you correct, they say you have been too forward. You have not even heard anything yet. Paul was sterner than anybody. If I read all the letters he wrote to Timothy and to Titus, read all you see. He was very stern about anybody dropping an atomic molecular 
hint of anything different from the way it's supposed to be preached. He said, warn. What is he talking about? The style. Do you see that now? Let's go to James chapter one. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus. Watch who is his audience to the 12 tribes, Jews, scattered abroad among the Gentiles in the dispensation. Greetings, rejoice. See that now? Then he tells you, consider it woefully joyful. Why? Because Emperor Nero was destroying Christians like water. So people were asking questions that if we are born again and we have all that is in us, why doesn't God come and do something to save us from this wicked, diabolic king? Consider it hopefully, joyfully, my brethren, whenever you are enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort, fall into various temptations. See that now? So that was why he wrote to them. Once again, that means believers. Have you seen the style? Let's go to Paul's letter to Titus. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. I've given you witness one Romans, witness two one Corinthians, witness three Galatians, witness four first Peter, witness five first Timothy, witness six James. I'm giving you witness seven Titus. Paul writing to Titus, a born servant of God and an apostle, a special messenger of Jesus Christ, the messenger to stimulate and promote the faith of God's chosen ones, God's chosen ones, born again, and to lead them onto what? Look at that, to what? Accurate discernment, accurate recognition, accurate acquaintance with the truth. Do you see that? Which belongs to and harmonizes. There is no disparity with and tends to godliness. Godliness is salvation. He goes on, resting in the hope of eternal life, which the ever truthful God, who cannot deceive, promised before the world or the ages began. And he goes on, and he goes on, to Titus, my true child, according to a common general faith. We don't have two faiths. See that? Then he repeats the same thing here. For this reason, I left you behind you, Titus, in Crete, that you might set right what was defective and finish what was left undone. What was the defective thing? People were beginning to teach the word of God in the Old Testament differently from the way Jesus had given to them after resurrection. It was defective. See that now? So same way. So now that leaves us with two. There are only two books. Let me even come to the book of Revelation so that you not think that I'm being something different. This is what people make it. So let's go to Revelation as well. Let's go to Revelation chapter one. Let's look at the pattern. Those who say that Revelation is about politics and all that. Look at the pattern. Same pattern. Revelation chapter one. Watch. Look at it. He makes it clear. This book, the revelation of Jesus Christ, his unveiling of the divine mysteries. John borrows the word that Paul uses to refer to the Old Testament writings. Mystery. He said, I am writing, I'm writing this, even though it was a vision, but putting pen to paper to emphatically say the same thing Paul had been saying. What was Paul saying? Romans 16, 25. He said that, that may God strengthen you according to my gospel, which is according to the revelation of of the mystery, which was hidden in Christ, but has now been made known, which in former ages was not known. Same thing here. So you see, he has set the tone. So the book of Revelation cannot be different from Romans, 1 Corinthians, 
First Peter, First Timothy, James, Titus, in team. Just that the difference is that whereas in these other books, it was words. In the case of John, it was pictures before words, vision before it was written in words, symbols before words. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. His unveiling of the divine mysteries is not about politics. Divine mystery. The word mystery is the Greek word musterion. That which is written but had no explanation. And the word mystery always refers to the writings of Genesis to Malachi. You can do your own research. It is not about mystery as something we don't know. He said, and the word revelation is apocalypsis, the uncovering of how Jesus was conceived, hidden in types, in examples in Genesis to Malachi. God gave it to him to disclose and make known to his born servant certain things which must shortly, shortly and speedily come to pass. Now, this is what confuses people here. I didn't want to do this, but I need to do it. When they see shortly, they think it's not going to happen. No, the Greek word is tako, takos. We get the word takos, T-A-C-H-O-S, from the Greek, the English word takomita. It's not synchronous, it's tacos. What it means is that from the point of view of God from Genesis, when the time comes for this mystery to be revealed, it will happen swiftly. What is he referring to? All the prophecies were concerning Christ. What we say, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that will follow. What is the sufferings? His arrest, his beatings, his crucifixion, his death. That means Jesus only suffered in that short period. The whole process of him being arrested, taken to Pilate's Praetorium till his death happened so quickly. Within hours, that, that thing, that whole prophecy, which spanned thousands of years, had come to an end. If you calculate from the time he was arrested in the garden to the time he said, it is finished, and tacos, that is the word, like tacometer, the timeline, it was over in a moment of time. In its entirety, and he sent and communicated this. Look at this through his angel message to his born servant John, who has testified to and vowed for all that he saw in his visions the word of God and the testimony of Christ. He goes on and on and on and on. The seven churches. Shut up. See that now. Verse five. For you to know that the book of Revelation follows on in the same consistency of the epistles. And from Jesus, the faithful and trustworthy witness, look at the words he uses. First, the firstborn from the dead, he did not use the only begotten. The only begotten is used when Jesus was human, his incarnation. The firstborn of the dead is when he was raised from the dead. The word is prototokos. The prototokos of the dead. First to be brought back to life. And the prince ruler of the kings of the earth. To him, look at, look at it. To him whoever loves us and has once for all language of epistles lose the past and freed us past from our sins by his own blood. And formed as we are formed already, as into a kingdom, a royal race, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and power of the majesty and the dominion throughout the ages forever and ever. 
same style. There are only two books that does not start with these introductions is what? They are Hebrews and First John. So watch. Let's take our time. There's no rush. Hebrews 1. Watch. No name, no introduction to who he's writing to, but there is a clue in it for us to get a word. Hebrews 1, he just starts in many separate revelations. Polytrupos, of which set forth a portion of the truth. And in different ways, the Greek is polymeros. God spoke of all to our forefathers. Our is the key operative noun there. Demonstrative pronoun and then the noun there. Our. So he's not talking about you and I. The writer of Hebrews is talking about forefathers. Patria. Who are they? Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, our forefathers. So his attention is to the writings of the Old Testament and the history that follows. So this audience are Jews in and by the prophets. But in these last of these days, the word last days refers to from the time of the resurrection of Christ until he returns for the changing of our bodies. He has spoken to us in the person of a son. I'll not explain that. Whom, look at the past tense, whom he appointed heir already and lawful owner of all things. Now, the all things can mislead you to think all things like planets. The all things that refers to the prophecies, he's the end point. He's the end point of the prophecy spoken. Whom he appointed heir, and also by two and through whom he created the wells. Now, this word wells there, he's not talking about creation. The world of Noah, the world of Abraham, the world of Isaac, Jacob, their world is what he's talking about. The Amplified got it wrong here because the Greek word does not submit that it is talking about physical world. No. Their world. He's talking about the prophecies of their world. So this is the only book that does not do the same introduction. Then our subject of discussion, First John. Are you understanding it now? So let's deal with First John. We are writing no introduction. Nothing mentioned about the church. So straight away, the style of never mentioning the church the style of not pointing to the church made of Jews and Gentiles. When he's talking to the children, the Gentiles are part of it. Any nation apart from Israel that now the gospel is open to. When he's talking to Jews, that is when he stops. He ditches, he eliminates doing that introduction so that they, they will know that he is talking to both Jews and Gentiles. Just like the writer of Hebrews, the same style is what John did here. We, the we is we Jews, apostles, Jewish apostles, are writing about the word of life in him. Wait. Doesn't the born again man know that Jesus is about the word of life? We know that already. Who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard, whom we have seen with our own eyes, it looks like he's making a case to introduce and affirm. He's giving an affirmation. The veracity of Jesus. It appears that it's the same style he did in John, introducing Christ to Israel. Jews who never knew God. He's letting them know that Jesus is the God that our forefathers served. So this cannot be the Gentile as well, who is born again. Because we, the Gentiles, never had Abraham for a father. So the chapter one introduction 
it's clear that he was not even talking to the body of Christ. Because if it's the body of Christ, you mention, you say brethren, you say elected, you say the church. These three words were absent. Elected, brethren, the church was absent in this introduction. That is why you're going to take your time and read. And the life and aspect of his being was revealed, made manifest, and demonstrated. And we saw as eyewitness. Ah, ah. He's gone back to the incarnation of Jesus. He said, we are eyewitnesses. It can't be the church he's talking to. And are testifying to declare to you the life. When they preach the gospel to me, they told me that Jesus is the life. Don't I know that as a believer? I know that. So he cannot be talking to the believer. It means that his audience don't know that this man is talking about is the life. The eternal life who already existed with the father and who actually was made visible was revealed to us his followers. So disciples, verse three, what we have seen and ourselves heard, we are also telling you so that you too may realize and enjoy fellowship as partners and partakers with us. Question, isn't the believer already a partaker? Look at how he addressed believers in Hebrews. Watch, watch, look at it. Look at this, look at this. Look at Hebrews. Look at Hebrews. Look at Hebrews chapter three. Oh, come on. Look at Hebrews chapter three. Look at this. Look at when, look at when he's talking to Christians. So then, brethren, and consecrated and set apart for God, who share? The word share means participate. The Greek word is metokos. We share in the same heavenly calling. See that? Huh? Thoughtfully and at then consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest, whom we confess, homologio, as ours, when we embrace the Christian faith. So therefore, here he cannot, it is not be, it's, it can be. Look at it, look, going back. First John. What we have seen and ourselves heard, we are telling you so that you may, but we are. The believer is right. We may realize and enjoy fellowship. The believer is already in fellowship with Christ when they did, they got born again. As partners and partakers with us, come and partake what we have. The believer already has that. And this fellowship that we have, which is a distinguishing mark of Christians. See that now? That means those guys didn't have it. And he's saying that that is what makes us Christians, that our union in Christ is with the Father, which is the Son, Christ Jesus. And we are now, so he's not stating intent. He's not stating intent. We are now witnessing these things to you. He's now witnessing to you. The believer has, has already got that information. So that our joy, look at it, in seeing you included, the amplified body correct here. So that means these guys were not included. But the believer is already included in the commonwealth of Israel. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, formerly you were outside the commonwealth of Israel. But now in Christ, you who were once far away have been brought nigh by the blood of Jesus. You are hence but no longer strangers or aliens. So that's shows that in seeing you included cannot be believers. Maybe full and your joy may be complete. Verse five, and this is the message, the message of promise, 
which you have heard from him, and now are reporting to him. He's making a reporting. The believer has already received Christ. God is light. Doesn't the believer know that? And there is no darkness in him at all. No, not in any way. Look at it. So if we say we are partakers together, that means these Jews, they were priding in Abrahamic circumcision and the Mosaic law to say that we don't need anything about Jesus. Oh, See, the Bible always synchronizes. Let's go to Romans. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that. Look at that. Look at, look at, the, look at the boast of the Jew. Romans chapter 2. Hebadayama. Hebadayama. Hey. Hey. Hmm. Look at that. Romans 2 17. But if you bear the name of Jew and rely upon the law and pride yourselves in God and your relationship to Him, 18, and know and understand His will and decently approve the better things and have a sense of what is vital because you're instructed by the law. And you are, and if you are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, he's talking about Jews priding in the law that. When the apostles were preaching, we do, ah, we, our father is Abraham. We, we, we don't need this Jesus thing. A light to those who are in the darkness. You, you say you are correct of the foolish, a teacher of the child. It's having in the Lord the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Well, will you, well then, you who teach others, do you not teach yourself while you teach against stealing? Do you still take what does not belong to you? So he's saying that you guys are priding by the law. You who boast in the law. You see that we're boasting in the law. That is what he's addressing there in First John. See that now? So he says that, so if we are partakers together and joyfully living, and we live and move around, let me go back and say, um, yeah. And so if we say we are partakers and enjoy fellowship with him, when we live and move and are walking about in darkness. So what is that darkness there? The believer is not in darkness. In Ephesians says that ye are light. Walk as children native to the light. So the believer can be this. Darkness is the one outside Christ. See that now? We are both speaking falsely and do not live and practice it. We are both, we as Jews. So what we are, we are using the law as a qualifying mark. See, then we come to the verse 7 and I'll, I'll continue tomorrow. But if we really are living and walking in the light, the believer is already walking in the light. Light is symbolic of salvation. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Or the Lord is my light, referring to is my salvation. Then if, if truly you are in him, then that means you, have, you, you cannot, you, you have unbroken fellowship. You will not be going back to, you know, symbols of rituals. Why? Because the blood of Jesus, his son, would have removed all sin. And you don't need to be, if you say you are born again, why are you going back to two goats? If you understand that, why do you go up to two goats, rituals, shoe bread, incense, high priest, day of atonement, you no, know, huh? turtle doves, pigeon? Huh? Why are you still practicing that? How can you be practicing the two? That's why I said that if really you are working the light of that revelation of Christ, you will not go back to practice. You say, how can you have Christ there like today? We have Christ, we say we have to confess sins. We have Christ, we have to do whatever baptism. We have Christ, we have to eat bread. No, communion. I mean, you know, that's the same thing. Then you didn't understand that when you receive him, what uh, he has removed all sin from us, keeps us cleansed from sin in all its forms and manifestations. Let me end it. Then tomorrow, we'll deal with eight, nine, ten, and clear the bar. So already, from what we have read, from what we have read in looking at the pattern, First John 1, 9, chapter 1 was not speaking to any born-again person. John was writing to Jews who they call agnostics, who will not accept that it is Jesus, yes, but plus circumcision and mosaic law. 
I submit that you, having given you all that plethora of evidence, and we shall continue tomorrow in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Jennifer. Thank you. Bless you.